Well, greetings, my friends, on this feast day of Christ the King. Um, in preparation for our time together, I was interested if I was interested in learning if there were any uh, traditions associated with this Sunday that might be uh, specific to our community here at St. Luke's. Yeah. <laughs> um, apart from switching the frontal to festal white, it's very nice, isn't it? Good job, Chris. Um, and, in, and in years past, right, an array of pumpkins and gourds and the cornucopia of many things um, and, and those wonderful music selections that center on, on the kingship of Christ, um, not much was known about why we celebrate this feast when we do. And perhaps that's because the feast itself is so young compared to some of its siblings, right? We just did, just celebrated All Saints on November the 1st. And then we're, you know, we're moving into the season where we're, we're going to prepare for the Nativity of our Lord. And both of those services have been around for centuries. But the celebration of Christ the King is quite new to the church. Um, it was instituted actually by a pope, Pope Pius XI, in 1925 in response to the horrors of the First World War and the increase in secularism and nationalism in parts of the world. The title itself, right? Christ the King, or the Feast of the Reign of Christ, uh, sort of directly combats those forces, right? It, it directly confronts the powers of this world. And the readings, I mean, the readings in John that take us back to where Jesus is before Pilate uh, are so poignant, even today. Originally, this feast was celebrated on the last Sunday in October that we Protestants know as Reformation Day, right? That day when Martin Luther nailed the 95 theses to Wittenberg Castle, right? In 1970, however, another pope, um, Pope Paul IV, uh, moved this feast to the last Sunday of ordinary time uh, today. It's been said that uh, Pope Paul's intention in moving this feast was to associate this feast day with the season of Advent that begins next week. And this association, it was thought, would make the importance of this Sunday clearer as it kind of acts as a fulcrum, a pivot point, um, as we prepare for the message of Advent and the beginning of the church year. For all intents and purposes, this Sunday is kind of like New Year's Eve for the church, okay? Now you know in everything you ever wanted to know about Christ the King. Um, but there are a couple images that I wanted to, to raise up for us today to think about. Um, when I think about the readings and, and the music that we're singing today, first, the first image is the one that's on your front cover, okay? Um, and notice the lighting, right? Jesus before Pilate, right? And the light's coming in, and Pilate's in his white robe. He's clean, Right? And then you have Jesus, a very dark image of Jesus in the midst of his passion. It's a very dark time for Jesus. The second one, we don't really have a picture of, except the ones in our mind. And I think that one comes when, in the last hymn that we're going to sing today, which I think is a brilliant choice because it like, gets us right into Advent, right? 
the hymn, Lo, He Comes on Clouds Descending. And you probably picked up that in the, in the themes, right? In Daniel and in the Revelation to John, right? But it's that third verse that always catches me up, right? When it talks about those dear tokens of his passion, still his dazzling body bears, right? And it speaks to a time in the not-so-distant future when Christ will return. And he will do so bearing the scars of his crucifixion. The wounds themselves are healed, but they're still visible to the naked eye. And we as the faithful sing, Come, claim this kingdom as thine own. I think we are in the middle of those two images. I think we hold the truth of both of them every day of our lives. Of having been through something that has totally changed the course of history and looking forward to a new tomorrow. But we do so by not leaving the past behind. But by, I think, channeling its energy, channeling what we've learned through the pandemic, the periods of life with those that we've loved and lost, we channel all of that energy into a deeper love. And maybe joy. Can we go there? Maybe joy. I'm thinking back to the marriage the other week when they chose their gospel lesson. And it's the one from John where Jesus looks at his disciples and says, My prayer, my prayer for you is that my joy will be in you. And that that joy will be complete. On one occasion, when Jesus experienced this kind of ecstatic joy, he cried out to the people that were around him. He cried out, he said, I praise you, Father in heaven, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the prudent and revealed them to little children, to ordinary folk what the powers of this world might deem as insignificant. Maybe those who are poor and those who would be easy to forget. And we may not think, right, that uh, the, the insignificant, the poverty-stricken, or neglect are such great ideas. But Jesus states clearly that those who suffer those things belong to the kingdom that he is inaugurating. Remember the Beatitudes? Blessed are the poor in spirit, right? And therefore, God has identified with us just the way we are. And so it is that we stand before him week after week, praying that thy kingdom come and that his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Knowing, you see, that there is something different about both. That we are in fact citizens we have dual citizenship right and claims to both but my friends we have allegiance to one allegiance to Christ's kingdom that does not bow down to the powers of this world not even death If 
we remember John's gospel, it says that if Jesus' kingdom was of this world, that he certainly would have been rescued by his disciples, right? And not crucified. If the gospel somehow needed to be vindicated by a show of power, Jesus' trial before Pilate would have definitely been the place for that to happen in front of Rome, the power of the day. But that didn't happen either. Instead, Jesus remains before Pilate and he says, For this I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. And everyone who belongs to the truth will listen to my voice. And so here's the hard truth today, my friends. Here it is. The fact that nobody came to Jesus' rescue, even though he could have summoned legions of angels to defend him, is a good indication of the nature of this kingdom. It means that the kingdom is present without our being rescued from our difficulties and the consequences of our own sinfulness. And that's hard, hearing that. Because we so much want to be rescued. But you know what it is? It's real. And I don't know about you, but I want this to be real. God is present in our lives and deaths just the way they are. Whatever happens, right? The divine presence, not as we would like it to function, but as it actually functions, is ever changing, not the painful experiences of our lives. but our attitudes towards them. In this kingdom, we experience our brokenness and our trust in God. Rather than our virtue and trust in ourselves. And for what that's worth, that is good news. This is no tale of our ancestors. But the living word in a real kingdom where we now live by faith and not by sight. Where we live for each other and for him who died for us and will raise us up on the last day.